pleasure to be here with all of you. And I have to admit, I have an agenda, which is that I hope you will realize by the end of our time together that you can actually play and have, have a role to play in creating an exponential improvement in health. Because really what we need if we're going to do that is entirely new minds thinking about what it takes to create health, well-being, and equity. So our, our time together, in order to help you do that, we'll talk about sort of the vision of an exponential improvement in health, well-being, and equity that we've begun to create with a challenge that we've taken on, 100 million people living healthier lives by 2020. To prepare you, I'll give you a five-minute crash course on population health. Um, talk about some of the key shifts that we're learning we need to get it to go from here to there. Give you share some stories about how thousands of innovators from around the world at every level, from the federal level in multiple countries all the way to the ground level of community health workers, villagers, and teachers and communities are beginning to show how this change can happen and then invite you to be part of this. So as, as I begin, I have to start with where I first learned about exponential innovation, which was in the Rupununi region of Guyana from Barca Foundation. So the Rupununi region, if you, how many of you have heard of the Rupununi region of Guyana? It's, it's the second poorest region and the second poorest country in the, in the Western Hemisphere. And over the course of 10 years, achieved some of the most dramatic improvements in health and well-being across sectors that I've ever had the pleasure to see as someone who now travels all around the globe looking at and getting to, to study this. 16,000 people, 33,000 square miles, 36 villages, in silos, rarely connected with each other, no, uh, nothing but dirt roads connecting them at best, uh, no communication infrastructure, uh, certainly not no electricity, far less cell phones at the time and the, the highest level of education being a fifth grade education. What that means is that teachers would come out, would have a fifth grade education and then, then come back to teach the next generation. Can you imagine that? What that would do to a place over time? But what was very different about Barca Foundation was their foundational premise that they believed that the people in this region had the solutions within them. They called, they said that they believed that they were noble, that if they could, instead of imagining themselves as being needed in the long term, could imagine a 10-year course during which they would not be in the region anymore, but where in that 10 years, they would accompany the people in this region to unlock the trapped and untapped potential that they had to create the change in their communities, that, they, that something would happen. And I have had the pleasure now of watching this story over 20 years, and get to actually walk, work with some of the community health workers, villagers, and teachers of the, ch the children of those original ones that I work with, which makes me feel really old and really proud. Um, but I just wanted to introduce you as they did that. You know, at the beginning, everyone did pretty common things, like the public health campaigns. They learned to look at their data. They learned to understand how to create change. They had some writing in campaigns to get community health workers that weren't getting paid paid. They began to help. Um, train up community health workers who just had three months of education and were sent back to take care of the health of their communities with no other health infrastructure. They began training them up and upskilling them, and they began improving the general knowledge of the village about um, what it took to create health. But something really interesting happened by year five. By year five, they knew how to do these skills. These community health workers, villagers, and teachers had run multiple projects, and they, the program said, we need to create a shift. We need to now begin that process of transitioning leadership. And they began training them in how to help, help create a vision for the community, how to bring others together, and to then, with together, begin to lead to what might be the changes that they need, looking at their data and understanding their context. And that was when everything broke loose. This is Eugene McCabe. He's one of the most brilliant innovators in the world with fifth grade education plus. <laughs> Eugene was able to lower the incidence of malaria by 90% in one year while eliminating malnutrition among widows. See, the thing is, everyone kept going and trying to educate them that you need mosquito nets. People knew that. They just couldn't afford mosquito nets. Eugene 
knew looking at his village and having assessed his village that there were a group of women who couldn't make it, uh, who were widows who couldn't make it anymore. They were malnourished because farming is a two-person job in, in the Rupununi region of Guyana. He had the trust in his community to be able to get the women to stop farming, a huge risk, and instead to form a sewing cooperative, to weave mosquito nets and trade them to the rest of the village in return for food. In one year, with well-documented reports, they had reduced the incidence of malaria by 90% and eliminated malnutrition among widows. And I would suggest to you that that isn't a solution anyone from the outside could have seen or had the trust to execute. This is another community health worker, Eduardo. He remembered something that he'd learned, which was that the literacy of women was the most important predictor of, of long-term health. And of course, most women in this village were, uh, in these villages were illiterate. He also knew that there were uh, incidences of acquired developmental delay. Pe kids were born, they were fine, and then by age five, they had developmental delay. And, and they measured these and tested this. His solution was very simple. He created a nursery school. When funders would come by and say, I think your village needs a new tin roof in your school, he'd said, no, no, what we need is a nursery school. Can you help build what we need and create a proposal and, and get the funding that they needed? By doing that, within a, a year, he'd eliminated acquired developmental delay in his region because they had the relationships in this program, bringing people across this region together over the course of five years of relationship building, that solution spread and scaled throughout the region. And within a few years, as the community began to think from a long-term perspective and as a region about how they would improve their health, they decided that the most important thing that they could do was to invest in a high school. And so they put all their resources together with teachers contributing and volunteering their time, their effort. And within 10 years, they developed their own doctors, their nurses, midwives, a huge science curriculum, and are now solving many of their own problems themselves. It wasn't one solution. It wasn't one innovation that we came up with. It was unlocking their ability to create their own exponential innovations and trusting that they would. Thank you. From, from Varka Foundation in this, the Rupununi region, I learned about a very powerful way of being and doing in the world that could be taught anywhere, and I've spent much of my life seeing when you apply it to other contexts, does it still work? Short answer, it does. It's, I feel like most of what I've received in terms of awards or recognition really come from that. So as we think about this, here are some of the things that they figured out. First, they had to go from thinking in a me to a we. They had a leg up. They naturally saw that their communities were about that. They had to go from being isolated as villages to being interconnected, to see that their fates were dependent on each other, and to be from isolated across sectors. I'm a villager, I'm a teacher, I'm a community health worker, to being a team that was responsible collectively for improving the health of the region. They had to go from pathology, all these things don't work. Transportation doesn't work, communication doesn't work, et cetera, you name it. When will they come and fix this? to a vision for what it could look like to have the health and well-being of their community and the courage to go after that vision with no sense, and this was something that they were remarkable at, with the sense that it was their responsibility to improve the health and well-being of their community. And yes, the government had a role to play, but they needed to create that vision first and figure out how to do it. From poverty um, to potential. If the Rupununi region hadn't had seen this simply as a, pla a, a, as a place of poverty, if the Barca Foundation hadn't believed that potential was there, they wouldn't have tried. They wouldn't have actually gotten ever to those results that were the breakthrough results that they got to in year six through 10. Because it was really that belief that there was trapped and untapped potential in communities of poverty. And I'll tell you as someone who spent the next 20 years doing exactly that, that you, that story repeats over and over and over again in achieving breakthrough results at a shockingly fast pace. Thinking from scarcity to abundance, the widows, the widows were an asset. Who would have thought? It's really thinking differently 
that helps us to get where, where we need to go. And I'll show you some answers about that. From having answers to asking questions, they didn't need the best plan, they didn't need everything figured out, but they needed to keep asking, how's the life of our village gonna get better? Whose lives are gonna get better because we're here? And how do we learn our way to what it takes to get there? They learned methods of learning and improving and using data to track their improvement and stories and mapping to understand what needed. And they embraced system transformation. When they realized that the biggest barrier to their long-term success was the lack of a high school in their entire region, they didn't dance around it. They didn't create a thousand workarounds. They just figured out how to create a high school. And on and on and on, they just took the big challenges and, and embraced them. Fast forward to here, we may feel more affluent, but I would suggest that we're in as perilous a place as the Rupununi region of Guyana was 20 years ago. Um, this is a map of, of a, a cartoon of what's happening in our country. 30% of the average family's median income goes to spending in health care. Two times, we spend two times the cost as any other developed country and are ranked about 37th in terms of health outcomes. And the population demographics are changing worldwide to accelerate and worsen that trend. Bottom line, as the population gets older, has more and more chronic disease, the cost of chronic disease is unsustainable. And this is not just a US problem, this is a global problem. Pink line is infectious disease coming down. Purple line is cardiovascular and chronic disease going up. And the blue line, interestingly, is violence that comes from growing social inequity. The cost of chronic disease in the US alone, just for one chronic disease, diabetes and prediabetes is $322 billion a year. By 2020, that's projected to go up at $500 billion. There's, that's exponential growth, all right. Not sure it's the exponential growth we want. We happen to lead the world in the precondition to diabetes, which is uh, having obesity, which is the largest risk factor to having diabetes. Breakthrough outcomes in healthcare won't be enough. So I came back to the US, applied all of what I'd learned in Guyana, ended up over the last uh, 12 years leading, leading the transformation of one of the Harvard Medical School health systems. And it was lauded as one of the four innovative and effective transformations in the country. Best in care outcomes, 36% reduction in hospitalization rates, right? That all sounds great until you look at that red line. That red line is the number of new people who develop diabetes and prediabetes in that time. I describe this as the 5,000 to one problem. The average person with diabetes will see their doctor four times a year for four 15 minute visits. That's about an hour. Even in the best of healthcare systems, maybe they'll increase that to three hours or even five hours in a year if you count all providers that might be seeing somebody. They'll spend 5,000 hours at home managing their diabetes. The healthcare system is a sick care system. It's not designed to meet people where they're at in their home to manage their chronic disease where they most need it. What makes matters worse is when you really look hard at this issue, you realize that actually this happens all the way from the beginning. Two children born, 20, born just, uh, who will grow up two miles apart at birth, born in the same hospital, will have a 25 year difference in their life expectancy. One will have the life expectancy of a child in Zambia, and one will have the life expectancy of a child growing up in Sweden, two miles apart. And when you look at this graph, you begin to understand why. Health is a function of place in the US and in most other countries in the world. On the left-hand side, these two maps look similar. One is a map of economic hardship on the left, and the, on the right is a map of childhood obesity. We are creating the chronic disease, and in fact, if you look and do biomarker research, it turns out that a child growing up in chronic levels of stress in the home from zero to five, such as a child growing up in a family that's experiencing economic hardship, will have a 40-fold higher risk of developing chronic disease. As a primary care physician, providing the best of care in one of the best health systems in the entire world might be able to lower their risk by twofold. It's like trying to put out water, uh, pour water on a fire while there's a gasoline tanker pouring gas in at the same time. It just doesn't work. So how do you, how do, you do something different? 
So we believe there's five key shifts that we need to make to get there. The first is we need to go from thinking about healthcare system that's a medical care system to a health and well-being system that's much more comprehensive, that understands and integrates what's needed to create health and well-being across the life's lifespan, and that sees itself as working across sectors in the same way that they did in Guyana. We need to see our work on addressing inequity not as a nice thing to do or a good thing to do, but actually fundamental, that we can't afford the cost of inequity and poverty any longer, not either in terms of health outcomes or cost. We tend to see these as big, chronic, difficult problems, the wicked problems, and then we sort of use that to say we can't deal with it. But really, we need to have the courage to go from pathology to vision. And as we go from pathology to vision to ask what's possible, then we can begin to create the innovations that get to the solutions. We need to go from scarcity to abundance and go from thinking of communities of poverty and people of poverty to people of, and communities of potential, just as they did in Guyana. And we need to go from a me to a we, from silos to interconnectedness. And fundamentally, these shifts and a system to help create that of a global innovation community that's taking on this challenge is what 100 million healthier lives is all about. We describe ourselves as an unprecedented collaboration of change agents globally who are pursuing an unprecedented result of 100 million people living healthier lives by 2020. By assuming it's possible and then figuring out how to get there, we're thinking in entirely different ways about how we create health, well-being, and equity at an exponential level. Equity, working on, uh, which we describe as um, thinking about how people reach their fullest human potential is the price of admission. If you want to learn more about the details, go to 100mlives.org. Um, our theory of change is very simple. The unprecedented collaboration, innovative improvement, which is in the same way that they did in Guyana, those ways of being and doing, and system transformation collectively will get us there. And we've been testing out what that looks like. And so what we begin to do together to make that possible is we build a joyful, thriving movement that and create a culture of health and, and, and and a practice of well-being. We figure out how to build joy and capacity and change leaders at every level, whether you're the Surgeon General of the United States, who's a, a part of 100 Million Healthier Lives, or whether you're a community health worker working on the ground. We teach those ways of being and doing and ask people to ask whose lives are getting better because we're here, who's not thriving, what would it take for that to change. With support, we connect people. Ask people have a piece of the puzzle here that somebody else needs, we begin to connect them with one another. And we create tools and resources and platforms we need help to do this better, which makes everyone's work visible, which makes people's insights visible, which makes the things that they tried that didn't work visible, so that we can begin to connect and work together in the way that they learned to do in Guyana. We support health and well-being for those who aren't thriving, and then create that connecting trellis support for others. And finally, where there are systems factors, whether it's payment, data integration, Whatever that might be, we work with federal partners at the multiple countries uh, to be able to take on those challenges. And we look, ask, look for technology to be part of the solution in some of those systems issues. In about a year and a half, already over 900 million partners and members who in, across 15 countries have adopted this challenge. Collectively, they reach over 100 million people uh, in the world, getting close to 200 million now. And they all ask these questions. Whose life is getting better because we're here? How do we know that? Who isn't thriving? What would it take for that to change? And learning to create the measurement systems that are not the large, big data, but that connect in with those, data, those reported, but that are the measures that matter, that are for the person on the ground creating change, and the technologies that enable them to create breakthrough exponential improvements, that's what we uh, enable. And this is just a map of some of the people who have begun to create change. All the way from Two Lakes Elementary School on the left-hand side that's figured out how to um, break through the achievement gap for uh, kids growing up um, from minority backgrounds and in poverty, to right here in Palo Alto Medical Foundation that figured out that social isolation was driving poor outcomes and decided that asset was actually the people who are elderly created time banking to help the elderly become resources to support those who are in the working and trying to make things work. 
which is a really great way of, uh, of solving social isolation to those on the to uh, the middle being the uh, uh, school kids, uh, a school teacher in Scotland who figured out how to eliminate childhood obesity by having our kids run a daily mile. They were more fit, they were more attentive in class, and the, she just figured out what it took to get there. This is being scaled across 60,000 uh, communities now. To someone else in, U, in UK, Joe Dickinson, who figured out that mail workers, postal workers, could become trusted deliverers, checker-inners of people who are in the frail uh, and elderly in their neighborhoods. They were already there. They were going into these neighborhoods already. To the Surgeon General's office, who's helping to create a, a campaign around uh, opioid addiction. These are all just ways in which people are beginning to create change. That leveraging of untapped potential. On the left-hand side, this is Ashley Atkinson. Ashley's in Detroit, and to her, the untapped asset was um, lots that were abandoned as, de as industry left for Detroit. And she said these could be places for urban farming. She has 8% of Detroiters as, gar as uh, urban farmers. See, they engage the community. The landscape has gone from feeling dilapidated and broken down to being these vibrant places of community. And oh, by the way, people's health outcomes have improved. Their insurance costs are lower. So it's the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation that's supporting her efforts. On the right-hand side, Stephen Thomas figured out that the most trusted people, if you want to reach the African-American community in Maryland, it's barber shops and beauty salon owners that have the trust, not the doctors. He and Freddie Spry have created the Hair Network, and their goal is to have a network across the country of barber shops and beauty salon owners who are breaking the cycle of inequity, of health inequity as trusted agents of change. When you start thinking from an abundance mindset, you begin to have very different solutions. At Cambridge Health Alliance, we just figured out that people, kids spend only a one time seeing their doctor, their pediatrician, and every day in school and at home. If you could actually get the teachers and the school nurses to have access and ready ability to help notice when a kid is having trouble breathing and to intervene long before they came in, we could reduce hospitalization rates by 90%. Why did the schools care? They wanted kids in school. That's what helps their achievement rates. It's finding those win-wins and making the win-wins easy. And yes, we had to have the technology to connect all the data and to make it easy, but it was a human system agreements and understanding along with the technology that made the 90% reduction in hospitalizations possible. Gary Slutkin on the left-hand side looked at curves of violence in Chicago and figured out that you could get, it looked a lot like the tuberculosis uh, curves. And he wondered, we think of violence as a social disease, but in fact, what if it's an infectious disease? Someone gets exposed to someone who's violent, they get angry, they become perpetrators, they pass it on. And so he trusted that out. And by using the same ways that he was interrupting tuberculosis transmission in refugee camps in Somalia, he applied those methods to create violence interrupters who could actually interrupt the transmission of violence in Chicago. And then in 20 neighborhoods across the country and now across the world, leading to a 50 to 73% reduction in violence in these communities. On the right-hand side, um, Greg Cruteau, leveraged people who are former gangbangers, saw them not as people who were lost, but as people who had, the, who had leadership, who had the opportunity to create a difference if they wanted or were ready to get out. And in doing that, he was able to reduce the reincarceration rate for urban youth from 60% to 2%, saving per youth the equivalent of a college education, not just for four years, but for the rest of their lives, given the rate of reincarceration uh, in these communities. These solutions are there, but they're not connected. They have no system through which they can spread and scale. And a lot of what we're trying to do is not just help find these people who are all acting in this new way of doing, but to create a connected infrastructure where they can go to scale. What could you do to help us with that? We're trying to figure out how to grow the thousands of people who are creating these kinds of solutions, getting hundreds of people housed, uh, and learning uh, how, what we could do to scale. Um, at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, we worked with Ghana to help community health workers be the developers of solutions for how to keep kids under five uh, alive and, uh, and helped achieve a 30% countrywide reduction through a model of scale up that's been replicable and now try, is being tried across five countries in Africa. 
scaling isn't an unsolved challenge. It's something you have to learn and test your way through. But there are methods by which we can do this if we have the will. The question is, do we? If we're going to achieve exponential improvement, it's not just a technology. It's not the methods. It's the will. It's our mindset that we need to get there. And so I invite you to think how we can scale the bright spots of educational reform in places as diverse as South Africa and Afghanistan and Oklahoma that are finding ways to utterly transform the outcomes for kids at, that you wouldn't expect to be able to do that to how can we think about scaling up these ways of being and doing, which we have now proven in over uh, 21 states is possible to do, to how we create the infrastructure for the movement. And so I invite you to help us do these five things. Create a connect, connected, open, accelerating, nimble, light infrastructure for global innovation. How would we do that? What are the tools? What are the methods? How do we scale the bright spots? How do we scale these ways of being and doing to create hundreds of new innovators who are achieving the kinds of breakthrough results that, 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 that the, such as the one I mentioned? How do we integrate big and small data to help us? And how do we help 100 million people to live healthier lives by 2020? And then the next 100 million, and the next 100 million after that. Thank you. Thank you.